Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. This next book is called The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle, which is a novel by Tobias Smollett. This book was originally published in 1751. The author was Tobias Smollett. It's 372 pages, and it's involved in a series of books which was preceded by The Adventures of Ferdinand Count Fathom, Part 1, followed by The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. The book is a little old now, a few hundred years, but I hope you enjoy listening to it, but in a way that is thoroughly soothing and perhaps not so exciting, but enough to keep you in a state of sleepiness. Enjoy. Let's now read The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle, which is a book that was written some time ago, and we will start with Chapter 1. An account of Mr. Gamaliel Pickle, the disposition of his sister described. He yields to her solicitations and returns to the country. In a certain county of England, bounded on one side by the sea, and at the distance of one hundred miles from the metropolis, lived Gamphalil Pickle Esquire, the father of that hero whose adventures we propose to record. He was the son of a merchant in London who, like Rome, was from a small beginnings and had raised himself to the highest honours of the city and acquired a plentiful fortune, though, to his infinite regret, he died before it amounted to a plum conjuring his son, as he respected the last injunction of a parent. To imitate his industry and adhere to his maxims, until he should have made up the deficiency which was a sum considerably less than fifteen thousand pounds. This pathetic remonstrance had the desired effect upon his representative, who spared no pains to fulfil the request of the deceased but exerted all the capacity with which nature had endowed him in a series of efforts which, however, did not succeed, for by that time he had been fifteen years in trade. He found himself five thousand pounds worse than when he was when he first took possession of his father's effects, a circumstance that affected him so nearly as to detach his inclinations from business and induce him to retire from the world to some place where he might at leisure deplore him from his misfortunes and by frugality secure himself from want and the apprehensions of a jail with which his imagination was incessantly haunted. He was often heard to express his fears of coming upon the parish, and to bless God that, on account of his having been so long a housekeeper, he was entitled to that provision. In short, his talents were not naturally active, 
and there was a sort of inconsistency in his character. For with all of the desire of all the anassing which any citizen could possibly entertain, he was encumbered by a certain indolence and sluggishness that prevailed over energy, interested consideration, and even hindered him from profiting by that singleness of apprehension and moderation of appetites which have so frequently conduced to the acquisition of immense fortunes. Qualities which he possessed in a very remarkable degree. Nature, in all possibility, had mixed little or nothing inflammable in his composition, or whatever seeds of excess she might have sown within him were effectively stifled and destroyed by the austerity of his education. The sallies of his youth, far from being inordinate or criminal, never exceeded the bounds of the dissident jollity which an extraordinary pot on extraordinary occasions may be supposed to have been preceded in a club of Zidate bookkeepers, whose imaginations were neither very warm nor luxuriant. Little subject to refined sensations, he was scarce ever disturbed with violent emotions of any kind. The passion of love never interrupted his tranquillity, and if, as Mr. Creech says after Horace, not to admire is all the art I know, to make men happy and to keep them so. Mr. Pickle was undoubtedly possessed of that invariable secret. At least he was never known to betray the faintest symptom of transport, except one evening at the club where he observed with some demonstrations of vivacity that he had denied upon a delicate loin of veal. Notwithstanding the appearance of phlegm, he could not help feeling his disappointments in trade, and upon hearing the failure of a certain underwriter, by which he lost five hundred pounds, declared his design of relinquishing business and retiring to country. In the resolution, he was comforted and encouraged by his only sister, Mr. Grizzle, who had managed his family since the death of his father and was now in the thirtieth year of her maidenhood with a fortune of five thousand pounds and a large stock of economy and devotion. These qualifications, one would think, might have been the means of abridging the term of her celibacy, as she never expressed any aversion to wedlock. But it seems she was too delicate in her choice to find a mate to her inclination in the city, for I cannot suppose that she remained so long unsolicited, though the charms of her person were not altogether enchanting, nor her manner over and above agreeable. Exclusive of a very one, not to call it sallow complexion, which perhaps was the effects of her virginity and mortification, she had a cast in her eyes that was not at all engaging, and such an extent of mouth as no art or affection could contract into any proportionable dimension. Then her piety was rather peevish than resigned, and did not in the least diminish a certain stateliness in her demeanour and conversation 
that delighted in communicating the importance and honour of her family, which, by the by, was not to be traced two generations back by all the power of heraldry or tradition. She seemed to have renounced all the ideas she had acquired before her father served the office of sheriff, and the era which regulated the dates of her observations was the mayoralty of her papine. So solicitous was this good lady for the support and propagation of the family name, that suppressing every selfish move, she actually prevailed upon her brother to combat with his own disposition, and even surmount it so far as to declare a passion for the person whom he afterwards wedded, as we shall see in the sequel. Indeed, she was the spur that instigated him in all the extraordinary undertakings, and I understand whether or not he would have been able to disengage himself from that course of life in which he had so mechanically moved, unless he had been roused and actuated by her incessant exhorations. London, she had observed, was a receptacle of antiquity where an honest, unsuspecting man was every day in danger of falling a sacrifice to craft, where innocence was exposed to continual temptations, and virtue externally persecuted by malice and slander, where everything was ruled by caprice and corruption, and merit utterly discounted and discouraged and despised. This last imputation she pronounced with such emphasis and chargen as plainly denoted how far she considered herself as an example of what she advanced and really the charge was justified by the constructions that were put upon her retreat by her female friends, who, far from imputing it to the laudable motives that induced her, insinuated in sarcastic condemnations that she had good reason to be dissatisfied with a place where she had been so overlooked and that it was certainly her wisest course to make her last effort in the country where in all probability her talents would be less eclipsed and her fortune more attractive. And that is the end of the story. I hope it wasn't too interesting, and I hope that you have a good sleep. Goodbye.